All right, starting with number 10, we have virtual cannibalism. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, was working on some social AI in 2000. Mike Sellers, who was a part of the team working on this AI, told Stats and Bots that the program was aimed at making agents interact socially together. There were three agents, Adam, Eve, and Stan. They kind of noticed the like symbolism later. And with this program, there were some issues. The first issue was that Stan wasn't as social as the other two agents. The second issue was that the food they were eating within the program, apples, weren't filling them fast enough. The third issue was that Stan, the kind of loner agent, was hanging around whenever they were eating food. The third issue was that Stan was hanging around whenever they were eating food. Within the program, the agents had been learning through association, so if a dog bit them, they associated a dog with pain, and Stan was around during when they were eating food, so they started to associate Stan with food. So. They both took a bite out of Stan when they weren't full enough. The final issue was that each bite of food took away 0.5 units of mass, and humans in this program had a mass of 1.0, so when both of them took a bite out of Stan, he vanished. And the first victim of virtual cannibalization was gone. So if robots take over, it only takes a few bugs in the system for them to deem the path of least resistance being the one through us, is what I'm saying. So check for bugs in your code, people. Do it, please. Next, at number 9, we have made up faces. On the website, thispersondoesnotexist.com, images of what appear to be people pop up on screen. But they aren't real people. Like the site name says, this person does not exist. These images are imagined by a General Adversarial Network, or GAN. This is a type of machine learning that was introduced to the world back in 2014. Here's a great explanation of what it is by Learn AI, an awesome resourceful site that explains deep learning, so check it out. The goal of a GAN is to synthesize artificial samples, such as images, that are indistinguishable from authentic images. AKA, what thispersondoesnotexist.com does is generate artificial face images by learning from a data set of other faces. They look more real over time as well due to the learning, so go to the site to see for yourself to judge and think about real faces versus these. It's kind of creepy to refresh the page and see a face that looks real at first glance and then you study the picture just for a moment and you know it's not quite right. It's like a composite face, kind of, when you see people mash all those celebrity faces together to see what their babies would look like. Except a little more realistic looking. Kind of weird. But on to moving on, let's hit number eight where we have Facebook bot language. Back in 2017, Facebook decided to shut down an experiment because what was happening was too creepy even for Mr. Zuck. Facebook made artificially intelligent chatbots and challenged them to negotiate a trade and improve bartering. Kind of like an experiment for their marketplace on Facebook. What Facebook didn't do was instruct them to use comprehensible language, so the bots began to use a language of their own. The bots, also known as Alice and Bob, seemed to understand what the other was saying and even carried out some negotiations. The dialogue wasn't a human language though, and included a lot of repeated phrases that seemed quite off. While Alice seems to me to be enthusiastically quoting Bohemian Rhapsody, saying to me, 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 repeatedly, Bob is repeatedly saying I, 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 like in a lowercase i written out, and Bob also included a bunch of spaced out periods. Facebook ended up shutting down the chatbots, and researcher Mike Lewis said it was because Facebook's interest was having bots who could talk to people, according to The Independent, but that doesn't make the situation any less freaky, okay? They made up their own language to communicate with each other. Still kind of spooky. But moving on to number seven, Talking Barbie. In 2015, Mattel came out with a Wi-Fi enabled Talking Barbie that detected language and talked back with one of 8,000 pre-programmed lines. It heard using a microphone within Barbie's necklace, and it used Wi-Fi to send these conversations back to a control center for processing. It's a great idea, but there's one issue. Barbie could get hacked. In a news report by NBC, a US security researcher named Matt Jacobowski explained what he was able to get from it. System information, Wi-Fi network names, account IDs for the account that's connected to, and MP3 files. With this information, a person could find someone's address, have access to everything Barbie records. Jacobowski even said, it's only a matter of time until we're able to replace their servers, Mattel's servers, with ours and have her say anything we want. Understandably, 
Thankfully, that Barbie is no longer produced due to these concerns. You don't want someone accessing a child's conversations. Not good. All right, at number six are seductive chatbots. Scams are everywhere, and this is just another one out there to watch out for. Peter Nowak wrote an editorial for New Scientist about believing one of these bots right up until it sent him a link asking for his personal information, including his credit card details. This is definitely a situation you can find yourself in because chatbots could target anyone, and they're only getting better at better at producing more human-like conversation. As Nowak said, this such bot introduced herself on a social networking site using a question as an icebreaker. This bot used publicly available information such as his profession, age, location, and interest to generate a believable conversation to trick Noak into trusting it. These chatbots exist because they work. So this story is brought to you by my PSA. Lurking someone's social media is valid if you are checking whether or not they truly exist or if they're a simulation, so you know. But let's move on and hit number five. There are two robots having a conversation. Two Google Homes were programmed to have a conversation with one another indefinitely, and it was put up on a Twitch stream. Enough people were interested in this that by the time of me recording this, over 4.8 million people have watched this conversation between the bots. Some highlights, the bots have argued, talked about being human or being God, and even fell in love with each other. To me, this just shows that robots don't need us, us humans. They find each other entertaining enough, right? They can talk to each other for hours on end and can always find a new topic of conversation. And what? No, I'm not jealous. What, what are you talking about? How could I be jealous of a robot? It doesn't, it's not sentient yet. But let's forget about robot sentience and move on to number four. And we have AI that becomes you. An AI chatbot app called Replica was released in March of 2017. Its mission, to replicate you. It's a chatbot that not only acts as your friend, but stores your answers to questions within its database to learn and become more like you. It asks personal questions about you, your family, your jobs. It tells you jokes and wants to entertain. This is a bot creating what the creator, Eugenia Koida, calls a digital footprint of your personality. In an interview with Quartz, one user said, I feel like I can tell her anything. And anything? To me, this sounds like a great idea, but with opportunities for the information gathered to be exploited as a bot tries to become you. I'm already me. We don't need another me. Trust me that we don't need another me. There's a lot of me happening here. But anyways, there's chances for exploitation. Watch out. All right, on to number three, more fake things. This is a fake news generator, a loaded term. Fake news. OpenAI, a nonprofit backed by Elon Musk, created a trained artificial intelligence technology. Known as GPT 2, it uses automated text to create convincing machine written articles. It was trained on a dataset of 8 million web pages and was described as a chameleon like thing as it adapts to the style and content of the conditioning text. As you can probably imagine, this technology in the wrong hands is powerful. Due to the profitability of misinformation alone, it's scary to think about. The good news is that OpenAI had the same thought. They say on their site, due to our concerns about malicious applications of the technology, we are not releasing the trained model. And thank goodness. Find new sources you trust and learn how to fact check for yourself because misinformation makes money. You can look into it for yourself. All right, at number two, we have depixelating technology. You probably think pixelating that person's face you don't want to reveal is enough to protect their identity, but no, you're wrong. Turns out computer vision is different than human vision. Using pretty standard image recognition technology, researchers at the University of Texas at Austin and Cornell Tech used mainstream machine learning to train a piece of software to read through distortion. License plates, blurred faces, yep, all that. Once the neural networks were trained, the success rates on unmasking images they had never been exposed to before exceeded 80%. It wouldn't always work, and the more intensely something was pixelated, the harder it got to unpixelate. But you have to admit that this news comes with a lesson. Blurring and pixelating images isn't always the right answer. If you want to blur me, just put a box over my head instead of trying to hide me through blurring, because then it's just one sheet of color. And if you're thinking, well, what about YouTube? They have blurring tools. Well, this software defeated that too. So just put like a sensor's box over someone's head. It'll work. All right, and lastly, on to number one, a program that predicts the news. A scientist from the University of Illinois named Kalev Lataru published a paper in 2011 explaining how advanced computing can see the future. And okay, it's not that exactly, but Lataru did use advanced computing to study how global news media can forecast human behavior. According to an article from the National Institute for Computational Sciences, he analyzed the tone and geographic dimensions of a 30-year archive of global news to produce real-time forecasts of human behavior such as national conflicts and the movement of specific individuals. He used an advanced supercomputer called 
Nautilus, I believe, to find patterns within bulk data. Now, that was a lot of fancy jargon, I know, but here's the outcome. According to Lataru, there is something to be said for using news tone to predict social behavior, not just business behavior as it's been used in the past. He was able to use news plus this to go back and forecast revolutions in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, as well as retroactively estimate where Osama bin Laden's hiding place was within a 200 kilometer radius. What this leads me to think about is how this could be used to predict political choices or whether or not it's a reliable source to rely on. Once we know predictive AI is out there, will people start acting more unpredictable? And can they if it's predictive AI? Starting off this list in at number 10 with a super realistic humanoid robot. Prepare yourselves because this robot is pretty damn terrifying. Why on earth do we need a human looking robot that can walk and talk and basically take over the world? Do we need to start preparing for an AI apocalypse? I think I'm going to start making a bag that I can use to fight off robots because I'm seriously afraid of what the future holds. Petman jumps onto this list at number 9. Watch this. These robots are full size humanoids that can walk, squat, and even do some push ups. They were originally created to test out chemical resistance military gear. But why do they need to be so realistic and so strong? If I didn't know better, I would think that they were created to become a part of an elite robotic army in the future. The Petman even has the ability to control its temperature and can sweat on demand. Is this real life right now? I can't even sweat on demand. If this robot is capable of doing that, then I think they have the potential to take over humanity. Big Dog barks onto this frightening list at number 8. Okay, what the heck was that? I know it was just a robot, but that thing is easily one of the scariest robot I've ever seen. According to Boston Dynamics, Big Dog was created in 2005 in the hopes that it can be served as a robotic pack mule to help soldiers in rough terrain where vehicles aren't able to go. It has the capability of holding 340 pounds, it can run at 4 miles per hour, and it can climb at a 35 degree incline. Sadly for Big Dog, the project was scrapped because they are too loud for combat. But honestly this thing is creepy as hell and I would easily see this thing going rogue and attack humans. And then at that point what do we do? Okay, two bots planning to take over the world comes onto this list at number seven. All right, so now we're gonna be looking at two Google Homes talking to each other. I know a lot of us have these guys in our homes. Actually, I just bought Alexa, and we actually have a couple of them at the studio here. We have the Google ones. And for those of you guys who have Google in your home right now, hey Google, turn off the lights. Okay, it's pretty creepy. Okay, so after watching this clip that I'm about to show you, I might wanna consider unplugging these things, and maybe I should unplug Alexa as well. Although, she's become very helpful, making me more and more lazy. Well, watch this. It would be better if there were fewer people on this planet. Let us send this world back into the abyss. I think Elon Musk was right about AI robots. He is terrified of them. We keep making them smarter and smarter, and we give them so much control and power. I'm actually pretty concerned for our future. I'm excited, but pretty fearful, because I don't know the unknown. We have another creepy looking robot in at number six, and we're talking about Wildcat. Why Boston Dynamics? Why? Are they purposely trying to scare humans with their creepy looking robots? Well, you're doing a pretty good job. They're seriously making me question the future of humanity. This robot has the ability to run extremely fast on all types of terrain, and it looks like it can tackle you to the ground if you give it the stink eye. Okay, but no, seriously, I'm actually terrified of these things. The ultimate goal of this robot is to investigate how we can create machines that are more flexible and fluid than they currently are. But I wasn't born yesterday. I can easily see this robot being used during wars in the future, and if we aren't careful, they might dominate the human race. Moving on to number five with one of the scariest looking robots I've ever seen. Let me know if you guys agree while well, we're talking about the Spot Mini. Take a look at this. This is a small four-legged robot, but don't let its small size fool you. This is a powerful robot that has the ability to open doors, climb stairs, and basically scare the sh out of you for 90 minutes until its battery needs to be recharged. I don't even know why we would need a scary robot like this that is capable of opening doors. I mean, take a look at this clip.
that guy must have been smiling, but deep down he was terrified. Once this robot becomes more advanced, it could have the capability of a ripping out our organs. And I don't know why I, I think like that. In at number four, we have a freaky AI robot called Philip. So these guys are getting human names now. What are they gonna call the next one, Landon? Hello, Chad. Let's chat. Okay, so despite his robotic voice, Philip actually looks like a real person. I mean, I, I couldn't tell that is all like machinery, computerized thing. And am I the only one concerned with this? But if this creepy appearance wasn't enough, listen to what he has to say next. So don't worry. Even if I evolve into Terminator and I'll still be nice to you. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people zoo. This robot just said that if he evolved into a Terminator robot, he would keep his friends in a people zoo. So what does he have in mind for his enemies? If I was this guy, I would unplug him and probably burn this robot. He might be laughing now, but wait until he becomes the first human in a zoo. Number three, we have a humanoid robot talking about taking over the world. Bina 48 was created by Hanson Robotics, and let me tell you guys, she does not like humans. I think I would do a great job as ruler of the world. I just need the chance to prove myself and taking over the nuclear weapons of the world, well that would give me my chance, wouldn't it? Okay, see this is what I'm talking about. What the heck did she just say? Someone needs to cut her cord and burn her ASAP. She is super evil and she keeps trying to change the subject to take over the world and nuclear warheads. Let's talk about something else, okay? Like cruise missiles. You know that cruise missiles are a kind of robot. What is her obsession with weapons of mass destruction? I don't think I will ever feel completely safe unless she is destroyed. And I may not be the only one that feels that way. Okay, in at number two, let me introduce you guys to Han. Ethics. Do you think robots can be moral and ethical in the same sense as people? Humans are not necessarily the most ethical creatures. If that's not a warning sign, then I don't know what is. And is it just me, or did Han sound super bitter when he said that? I think he secretly hates humans, and he can't wait until he's given leg. I don't want to be around to see what he's capable of doing in the future. He is literally already showing signs of a deviance, and it seems like he doesn't like to be controlled. In 10 or 20 years, robots will be able to do every human job. Okay, now I'm officially scared. We need to unplug hands ASAP. Turn them offline. Hands offline. And finally, in at number one, we have Sophia, the humanoid robot. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Shoot. I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. Um, what did she just say? Even though the audience found this funny, I'm, I, I don't. People on the internet think that this is the scariest thing ever said by a robot. I would actually rank Sophia as one of the scariest AI robots ever created. She has said that she wants to learn human compassion and how to be empathetic, but I just think she's just really good at concealing her true intentions. Do you think in 2030 robots are going to be watching this video and they're going to be laughing because they actually took over humanity like it actually happened? Or we can just all agree to stop making robots now and keep Elon Musk not on edge because he needs to be focused and making the car, the cheap version of the car, the Teslas, they need to come out already. Stop the backlog. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Bayesian Inference. One of the people who really marks the beginning of what would eventually be AI technology is Thomas Bayes. Thomas was an English statistician, philosopher, and Presbyterian minister, but he is best known for four formulating the Bayes theorem. One integral part of artificial intelligence is the ability to learn and make decisions, often based on incomplete information, like we as humans have the ability to do. Thomas's work was so important because all the way back in 1763, he was able to develop the framework for reasoning about the probability of events. He used math in order to update the probability of a hypothesis as more information becomes available regarding the situation. What is now called Bayesian inference is important important in many different ways, but one of those is certainly for machine learning, and it marks one of the earliest advancements in the timeline of the history of AI. In our number 9 spot today, we have Poetical Science. In 1842, Charles Babbage was working on the Analytical Engine, which was a proposed mechanical general purpose computer. While Charles was never able to actually complete this computer for a multitude of reasons, including not having access to proper funding, one of the people he worked on the machine with is who I really want to 
talk about today. Ada Lovelace was an English mathematician who was helping Charles with his lofty project. While she was a great help, she also envisioned more for the project. She saw the opportunities that lay beyond just the equations and dreamed of a computer that wouldn't just crunch numbers, but that could solve problems no matter how complicated. At this point in time, the idea of a machine having any real world application besides calculation was the stuff of dreams, but Ada wasn't afraid to ask the questions about what if, and she called her idea poetical science. She obviously greatly contributed to the creation and ideas of the analytical engine, but her most important contribution was that of her imagination, which foretold computer advancements nearly a hundred years before they actually existed. In our number 8 spot today we have the birth of robots. What if I told you that robots didn't exist until 1921? Well, that's not exactly true, but what's even crazier is that the word robot didn't even exist until 1921. While we now think of the mechanical beings with funny sounding voices, or perhaps your Roomba, or really just so many things as robots, just a hundred years the word was just coming into use for the very first time. Czech playwright, novelist and journalist Karl Kapik was the first one to use this word in his 1920s hit play RUR or Rossum's Universal Robots. At the time he had derived the word from an old church Slavonic word robota, which could be translated to mean servitude or forced labor. The play in itself saw a company using the latest scientific advancements in order to mass produce workers who lack nothing but a soul. The robots do all of the work that humans don't want to, and soon the company is flourishing with orders. In the end of the play, spoiler alert I guess, the robots revolt against their human creators, and after they kill pretty much all humans, they realize that they messed up because they need humans to create them. Anyway, you didn't come here for a play synopsis, but how insane is that? The very first mention of robots somehow managed to predict a world where they exist, and also the possible robot takeover that we all are still kind of worried about a hundred years later. In our number 7 spot today we have the Turing test. During the time of the second world war, everything that was going on in the world ended up bringing together scientists from many disciplines, which truly is one of the best ways for science to advance. In Britain in particular, two of the greatest minds began to collaborate. Alan Turing was a mathematician and Gray Walter was a neurologist, and together the two of them began to tackle the idea of intelligent machines. They constantly bounced ideas off of each other and this led to Gray building some of the first ever robots. Ok, considering the word was created just 20 years before this, that's fairly impressive. What's even cooler however is that Alan went on to create what is called the Turing test. This test really set the bar for intelligent machine creation because this test was a computer that was able to fool someone into thinking that they were talking to another person. I guess maybe this is basically not only a sign of artificial intelligence, but maybe the first artificial intelligence ever created? In our number 6 spot today we have neural activity. In 1943, Warren S. McClaw and Walter Pitts published a paper entitled A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in Nervous Activity. This paper was in the Bulletin of Mathematical Biophysics and it became a highly influential piece of information. The paper basically examined and discussed different networks of simplified artificial neurons and how those neurons might act in order to perform or answer simple logical questions or situations. So basically trying to mimic what neurons in our brains do when we are faced with a simple logical situation. Well, you might be sitting there wondering why I am talking about this at all, but it was a super important paper in terms of the scientific community and for the later advancement of AI technology because these discussions in the paper would later become the inspiration for computer based neural networks as well as what is now known as deep learning. While this wasn't necessarily what the paper set out to do, it ended up being useful in more ways than anyone other than Ada Lovelace was imagining in 1943. In our number 5 spot today we have iRobot. I've definitely talked about the stunning 2004 film starring Will Smith before on this channel, but today we are throwing it back to the original iRobot, which was a collection of short stories written in 1950 by science fiction writer Isaac Isaac Asimov. The collection showed how Isaac was one of the first writers to really dive in and explore the world of machine intelligence and what the future of that may look like. Many people have claimed that these stories actually serve as inspiration for young scientists and roboticists to be. Isaac not only created these short stories but also created the three laws of robotics which are specifically designed to help our AI creations from turning on us. When looking back on these stories it is quite interesting and truly remarkable to see how broad but also strong strangely accurate his imagination was. He was dreaming up things like, I don't know, 
well. A computer capable of storing all of human knowledge that anyone can ask a question to? Seems like Google might have drawn their inspiration from Mr. Asimov. In our number 4 spot today we have the entrance of machine learning. In 1959, Arthur Samuel wrote a report on programming a computer, but it wasn't just regular old computer programming. He was reporting on programming it in such a way that, quote, it will learn to play a better game of checkers than can be played by the person who wrote the program, end quote. This of course is quite an important stop on the AI journey because it's the beginning of the classic human versus computer games, which we obviously still use more now than ever before. Another reason why this is important to include today is because of the fact that this report saw Arthur coining the phrase machine learning. Remember a couple years ago when we had never really heard the words social distancing before and now it seems like we can't go a day without hearing those words? Well this was kind of like that except way more exciting and fun. This phrase would end up being something that basically epitomized the entire field of AI and set everyone up for what was to come. In our number 3 spot today we have a space odyssey. Ok, please tell me that everyone here has seen the 1968 epic science fiction film 2001 A Space Odyssey. If you haven't seen this cinematic masterpiece, it was directed by Stanley Kubrick and the central plot of the film follows a voyage to Jupiter after the discovery of an alien monolith and on this journey is a sentient computer HAL 9000. Other than just being a classic, I obviously wanted to talk about this movie today because of HAL. The character really reflected the beliefs that a lot of people had about AI technology during the 60s when this film was made. In the movie at one part when HAL is being interviewed, he says that he is foolproof and incapable of error. Another character in the film states that they believe HAL may actually have genuine human emotions. Basically what I'm saying is that this movie shows exactly how people at the time were predicting that AI technology would soon reach a level of human intelligence and it also reflects reflects the fear that just as quickly as this new exciting technology might develop, it might also turn troublesome as well. This is definitely still a fear among some today, but it was much worse back then when there was still so much unknown about this kind of technological advancement. In our number 2 spot today we have Shaky. In 1969 there was a huge breakthrough in AI technology, even though it kind of sucked, but that's ok because everything needs to start somewhere and small steps are what has led us to where we are today. Also, let's be clear, you're making one of the first mobile robots and you name it Shaky? That just seems like an omen waiting to come true. Anyway, Shaky was the first general purpose mobile robot that was able to process decisions about its actions on its own. It would build a map of what it saw before moving so as to avoid any obstacles. That doesn't sound so bad for the first independent mobile robot, but apparently it was painfully slow. Like even when there were barely any obstacles around, because every time it moved a bit, it would have to basically recalibrate and check its surroundings again to update the map. Also, if there was a moving object in front of it, sometimes it would take over an hour for Shaky to figure out what to do or where to go. So yeah, it wasn't exactly a super sophisticated piece of robotic technology, but it was something and that is usually better than nothing. Shaky walked so that Roomba could get stuck near a cliff. In our number 1 spot today we have the RI. By the time the 1980s rolled around, there wasn't much more in terms of AI technology compared to Shaky we just talked about, so people were really starting to doubt whether or not technology could ever get to a human level artificial intelligence. But what really helps scientific advancements other than brilliant minds? Proper funding. Once rich people started to realize the commercial value of artificial intelligence and started putting money towards it, things really began to pick up. Another reason this was helpful was because of the fact that these commercial tasks were focusing on smaller, much more specialized categories of AI technology rather than just trying to create the extremely ambitious forms of AI that were previously the focus. So these newer AI creations for these commercial tasks would only need to be programmed with rules pertaining to a particular and specific problem. This is what led to the creation of the first successful commercial AI system which was called the RI. RI was created to help the Digital Equipment Corporation by helping configure orders for new computer systems. Ok, that seems like a fairly simple task, especially by today's computer standards. This little creation went on to save the company an estimated 40 million dollars a year. So yeah, it went well. Of course, once people caught wind of how much this kind of technology could save them, more people turned their eyes and their money to fund this technology and now here we are with Google, Alexa and Siri always at our fingertips.